Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Ethical Humanist Society. My name is Bobby Jacob, and I'll be moderating today's program, Shared Journeys with Trickster Coyotes. Today's pl uh, platform is virtual, as you can see. Out of concern for everyone, the EHS has discontinued in-person gatherings. When the time is right, in-person gatherings will return. After the presentation concludes, the chat box will be opened up for question submission for the Q&A portion. I'll start out today's program with a quote that helps define what humanism means to us as members of the Ethical Humanist Society. I noticed that religion gave some people a way to escape dealing with the world. Things will be better when you die, the people of my grandma's generation said as they worked themselves to death. God wants you to forgive and love those who do you wrong, some people said, to shake off the shame of being unable to respond to the abuse they endured. The holier than thou faction found comfort in believing. The rest of y'all are lost because you don't have a personal relationship with God, our God. But art engages you in the world, not just the world around you, but the big world. And not just the big world of Tokyo and Sydney and Johannesburg, but the bigger world of ideas and concepts and feelings of history and humanity. And that was Wynton Marsalis from his book, Moving to Higher Ground, How Jazz Can Change Your Life. At the EHS, our programs address a wide variety of topics, including current events, philosophy, arts and sciences, to name just a few. Today's presentation is part of our ongoing programming relating to the environment. Today's speaker is Gavin Van Horn. Gavin is the creative director for the Center for Humans and Nature and author of The Way of Coyote, Shared Journeys in the Urban Wilds. His book explores what it means to coexist with urban wildlife often drawing from the wisdom of wildlife ecologist Aldo Leopold, Taoist philosopher Lao Tzu, and the North American trickster figure, Coyote. Today's talk will focus on the relationship between humans and nature with emphasis on story and science, ecological loss and ecological reconciliation, and the role wildlife can play in waking us to a shared sense of place and fate. He will highlight the ways in which Coyote as trickster may be an especially resonant archetype for this moment of change and social upheaval. Please welcome Gavin Van Horn. Hey, thank you, Bobby. Thank you for that introduction. And uh, I'm glad to be here with you all um, virtually as I stare at the green dot in the middle of my screen. But I welcome you into uh, my place of work, or at least it has been for the last year, um, my office here. and. Um, and I'm happy to uh, share with you this morning. So um, we'll get that started. Um, let's go ahead and pull that, pull the PowerPoint up. All right. So I'm a writer, and that might make me a little bit biased when I say that we're all telling stories. Think about the last good book that you read, and uh, or that you heard about. Someone may have said, or you may have said it really spoke to me. It really spoke to me. Think about that for a moment. Books aren't inert things. They are matches waiting for the flame of our imagination. Or perhaps less dramatically, they're conversation partners. That leads me into, from books into story. Why do people behave as they do? Why, for instance, do they tend and care for the earth or alternatively treat the earth as a giant Costco, a warehouse fit to be raided. Story. So people do the things they do because they feel they are part of a story, that their lives fit within this larger story. People care about humans, non-human animals, lands, air, water, or they don't because their story, the story that they carry around in their heads tells them how they should or shouldn't behave towards the landscape. So we commonly think of reading a book as a solo or solitary activity, that everything is happening in the mind in the 80 or so cubic you know, inches of gray matter uh, that we have in our, in our brains. But I'd like to suggest that this idea of a solo practitioner um, or an individual reader being separate from what they are reading is absolutely false. Uh, you can, we'll stop the screen share here. So most obviously we are in conversation with one another. 
uh, with, or sorry, with one another and with the author when we read a book. Their ideas, their skill at immersing us in uh, alternative worlds, the sensory immersion um, that comes from uh, reading a, a well-written uh, book. But we also are in conversation with ourselves, our memories of places, our heartaches, our triumphs, our small victories and elations. A good writer will prompt us to feel, to connect our lives to the world of the story, and they will engage our empathy. But unlike books, um, when it comes to life, the tricky thing is that most of us don't consciously know that we're living out a story. We assume we've got the facts and that others are deluded by myth. I'd like to challenge that. I think we all live in a narrative of valued things. Each of us is like a magpie who collects objects that sparkle. We line our larger story nest with these sparkly stories, vignettes, anecdotes, conversations, and family history. My book, The Way of Coyote, and we'll go back to the screen here, um, is a story about the city. It's an active effort on my part to show that the conventional story about the city that is often told, that the city is a thing in duality with nature, it, and that it is a lifeless world, subject only to human dominance and whim, is a story. It's just a story. And the idea that nature is um, somehow separate from where we live and not to be found in urban areas is a story. The story I tell in the book is that wildness can be found anywhere from all those little squiggly helpers in our gut microbiomes to the tree roots pushing up through the concrete to peregrine falcon nests on the top of Chicago skyscrapers. Cities are full of life. If we align our lifestyles with the needs of other creatures, cities can be even wilder. And I would suggest that uh, so can we. If you don't already think our society swims in stories, I don't think I'll convince you today in less than an hour of time. But maybe I'll help you think in a fresh way about the relationship between the stories we carry in our heads and the stories we enact on the landscapes that we're a part of. I'm here to talk about stories, but also their possible disruption. And the character, the archetype, most frequently called upon to disrupt convention, to gum up social uh, ways of, of being, static ways of being, and to unfold the folded lie, is the trickster. So I feel with all this talk about story, we should maybe have one early on here. In my book, which is mostly prosy, a mixture of travel, memoir, and ethics, I insert four little folk tales of my own. I try to imagine Coyote in his trickster persona uh, in his new urban home. So uh, a story for you. This begins the third section of the book, and it's called Coyote Creates New Paths. One day Monarch was flitting between gardens when she spotted Coyote gnawing on the corner of a building. Curious, she flew closer to see what Coyote was up to this time. Coyote, why are you grinding your teeth against this thing? Do you think it's made of bone? Monarch asked. It won't be much longer, Coyote bragged. I'm almost done. When she returned the next day, Monarch discovered Coyote in the same place, still chewing. Coyote, you must stop. Can't you see this isn't working? Your teeth are getting dull. You have to go around this thing. You can't go through, said Monarch. Exhausted, Coyote stopped chewing and sat on his haunches. You might be right, he conceded, realizing he had made no progress at all. The two rested for some time together, looking up at the sky, saying little. Then Coyote's ears pricked up. He ran to the river with Monarch close behind. When he reached the bank, he began scooping mud up in his paws and throwing it wildly about him in all directions. Monarch dodged this way and that, utterly baffled. Coyote worked hard into the night and beyond, and the longer he worked, the crazier his throws became, until finally he threw so hard he came apart completely. His tail going one direction, his arm another, his leg flying off to the south, another to the north, and his head landing with a thump where he once stood. A horrified monarch flew to the other animals with the sad news. When the animal people who attended Coyote's council in the woods found out what happened to Coyote, they came from all directions to see. 
Gathering in a circle around what remained of Coyote, they mourned their friend's condition. He did try in his own way, said Mole, whiskers vibrating. Yes, agreed Heron, slowly shaking his yellow beak. He was foolish and brave. Then one by one, the animals brought all of Coyote's parts and placed them in the center of the circle. They stared, not knowing what to do except to be troubled. Fox, a quick thinker who knows a bit of magic, strode up behind the mournful animals. When he peeked between Heron's legs and saw Coyote scattered about like a jigsaw puzzle, he felt pity for his cousin. Why are you all standing around looking so glum, spoke Fox to the others. This is a small matter. And so saying, he whispered some words and rubbed ash on Coyote's bones. When Fox had circled the bones five times, they began to quiver against the ground, sliding closer, then locking together until Coyote was all in one piece again. Coyote stood up and blinked, surprised to see the other animals gathered around him. His vision was still clouded. Squinting, he looked down at his body. What happened to my fur? He demanded for his fur was stained black in various places because of the ash fox used, especially the tip of his tail. Don't worry about your fur, said Heron. You should be saying thank you. Fox put you back together. And all of us helped, squeaked Mole. Did I do it? Coyote asked. What do you mean, did I do it? Heron scolded. Break yourself to pieces because of your wild ideas? Yes, I just told you, and we put you back together. How could you do that yourself? No, 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 Coyote scoffed. Did I build the paths between the buildings? Did the mud work its power? And sure enough, looking around, the animals saw that Coyote had done something great indeed, and they were no longer angry with him. This is how new paths came to the city. So let's talk tricksters. Are those of you uh, watching this live stream this morning familiar with the trickster archetype? If I say trickster, what character or animal do you think of? I'll give you a few seconds to think about what pops to mind. I suspect that even though we're not in the Pacific Northwest, some of you may have thought of Raven. Raven haunts the coasts of the Pacific Northwest. Maybe he's best known in America as a trickster figure. He's the fellow who will steal your food when you have your back turned, whose eyes, who eyes you as you walk beneath, underneath the telephone wire. Some bit of mischief brewing behind those shiny black pupils. There are stories about Raven, to be sure. But the trickster roams everywhere, just changes skin, puts on different clothes. For the Greeks, it was Hermes, or as he was known to the Romans, Mercury. The go-between messenger with winged feet between the humans and the gods. There is Ishu in West Africa, a divine being of doubleness. Ishu is the keeper of Ase, which is vital force. And according to Nigerian born author, Bayo Okomolafe does not deny difference. He queers separation. For Loko the Lakota, it's the spider, Iktomi, who wove webs of creation and cleverness. And to the Norse, it was Loki, before he became a blockbuster star in the Avenger franchise. And now apparently, He's getting his own television show on Disney, no less, all to himself. Thinking back to my own childhood, um, it was probably a particular Looney Tune character who rose up out of the character out of the carrot patch when a trickster was needed. Good old bugs. This is from uh, this uh, following quote is from Michael Shabon, a novel the great novelist. He says, trickster is the stealer of fire, the maker of mischief, teller of lies, bringer of trouble, upset, and above all, random change. And all around the world, think of Robert Johnson selling his soul. Trickster is always associated with borders, no man's lands, with crossroads and intersections. Trickster is the conveyor of souls across ultimate boundaries. 
the transgressor of heaven, the reconciler of opposites. He operates through inversions of laws and regulations, presides over carnivals and feasts of fools. He is hermaphroditic. He is at once hero and villain, scourge and benefactor. Trickster is also the god of the marketplace, of the city as intersection of converging roads and destinies and transfer points, as the primary locus of entertainment, that powerful means of exchange. And perhaps this is why cities, Indianapolis accepted, have always been built at places where incommensurates meet, sea and land, mountain and plain, coast and desert. Trickster goes where the action is, and the action is in the borders between things. So what's the role of trickster? To disrupt inflexible convention. The trickster helps us to see through the supposedly permanent things like social structures, laws, rules of thumb, blind order, and maybe even concrete buildings, infrastructure. Tricksters laugh or bungle through danger, exposing structures for what they are. Structures, temporary, agreed upon conventions, which are okay so far as it goes until such conventions become not okay, oppressive, deadening. The trickster scratches away to see what lies beneath, to get at what is foundational. And ironically, scratch far enough, peck long enough, and the trickster will show you change is the only constant. Though tricksters come out of the deepest wells of mythology, the point, they also point to a biological reality. As the evolutionary biologist Lynn Margulis and her son Dorian Sagan wrote, quote, every five days you get a new stomach lining. You get a new liver every two months. Your skin replaces itself every six weeks. Every year, 98% of the atoms in your body are replaced, end quote. All that self-maintenance, that bodily self-maintenance requires a lot of energy inputs. And that's where the self that is being maintained gets awful fuzzy. Margulis and Sagan note that what many of us likely absorbed as part of a standard sci science education, they write that most writers of biology texts imply that an organism exists apart from its environment and that the environment is mostly a static, non-living backdrop. But that's profoundly misleading. We need to rewrite these kinds of static dualisms according to Sagan because in an autopoetic world like the one we inhabit, independence is a political, not a scientific term. Independence is a political, not a scientific term. Life must feed, absorb, and exchange to self-maintain. It must change to stay the same. The person who literally wrote the book on tricksters is a gifted scholar and writer named Lewis Hyde. Here's what he has to say. Quote, Trickster is a spirit of the road at dusk, the one that runs from one town to another and belongs to neither. Travelers used to mark such roads with cairns, each adding a stone to the pile in passing. The name Hermes once meant he of the stone heap, which tells us that the cairn is more like a trail marker. It is an altar to the forces that govern these spaces of heightened uncertainty and to the intelligence needed to negotiate them. The best way to describe trickster is to say simply that the boundary is where he will be found, sometimes drawing the line, sometimes crossing it, sometimes erasing or moving it, but always there, the God of the threshold in all its forms. So what is called for nowadays in our times of uncertainty? Coyote as trickster embodies wildness, life force unleashed, undomesticated. They point out through their actions, through their very presence, when society is chained to a lifeless order, when control and constraint are elevated at the expense of play and spontaneity, tricksters seek a lively disorder. In myth and legend, Coyote is a venerated person, particularly among nat native peoples of the American West, from the Salish in Washington state to the Navajo in Arizona and still further afield. As historian Dan Flores notes in his book, Coyote America, which I would highly recommend if you're interested in the biology of coyote, as well as the sort of larger mythologies that surround coyote. Flores says, coyote is the most ancient de deity of which we have record on this continent. And stories about coyote, 
are likewise the oldest in North America. He says, no other native deity in North America came anywhere close to inspiring such a vast body of oral literature. West of the Mississippi, across the last 10,000 years, Coyote has been America's universal deity, surviving as a Paleolithic god among agricultural peoples like the Wichita's and ultimately reaching as far south as the Aztecs, who knew him as Hue Hue Coyoro, Old Man Coyote. Coyote is a piece of work, the trickster figure, comical body, occasional helpful, occasionally helpful, consistently entertaining. The lead essay in my book, The Way of Coyote, is about flesh and blood coyotes, but it is Coyote as trickster, the mischief maker, who felt compelled to nose his way into various sections of the book, parting the pages as he would little blue stem grasses in order to have a look around. This coyote is my attempt to give time-honored myths new clothes to transport him from legendary tales of adventures on desert mesas into his new bustling urban home. Or maybe he transported me. I haven't figured that one out quite yet. But the point that I think Coyote's presence in the city alerts us to is that trickster aspect, that the forces around us that surround us that we think of as, as permanent, as powerful, as all powerful even, the invisible grip of the market, pavement, the will of the gods, they seem immovable. And pavement might be an instructive way to think about the city because we know there's something underneath, some wildness that intrudes between the cracks, fights for space to be. And here it might be my optimism speaking, but I think that will eventually overcome all of our best laid plans and planning. So into the city comes Coyote, full of his own schemes. And there is a doubleness always to trickster's play. He brings the gift of release, but if one follows his way, he makes one a, wand uh, one a wanderer, uh, the object of misunderstanding. But in one sense, Coyote as trickster just reveals the world as it is, ever-changing, full of play and disorder, instability, and flip those over in their more positive aspects, creativity, serendipity, happenstance, happy accidents that occur for the trickified mind. The social order is the veil, and reality is flux. To follow trickster is perilous, rewarding, alienating, and maybe what must be done now uh, to renew what has become stagnant and ossified. So while Coyote came to the city, um, sorry, my memory usage just popped up on my screen. I hope that doesn't create any problems for us. Um, so Coyote came to the city and bigger cousins or other animals with more specialized needs couldn't follow. He came to shake things up, gambling on prospering alongside the two-leggeds, that's us. Um, and he may not have come with this purpose in mind, who can know the mind of Coyote after all, but the presence of coyotes in cities like Chicago tells us that given the chance, many, many other animals can thrive alongside us. Cities are just a particular and perhaps a little peculiar form of habitat. Coyote shakes up those divisions that we might hold in our minds between nature and culture, between urban and wild. Coyote has been shaking up things up on this continent for a very long time. Despite having every poison, trap, bullet, and barrier thrown in his path, flesh and blood coyotes have adapted. Now, every city in the United States is a home for coyotes. And they apparently, according to a recent report in Smithsonian Magazine, are on their way to South America. So Coyote keeps going along. Um, one of the tropes in Coyote tales told among various native peoples is to begin a story saying, instead of once upon a time, it will say Coyote goes along. So you're sort of dropped into the story mid stride because Coyote is perpetually uh, sort of a renewable source of energy, no matter if he's um, killed in a story, uh, he's always put back together. He always keeps going along. And I think that really reflects the lives of biological coyotes who have been um, persecuted in shocking ways in this country, but are 
unbowed and keep going along. Um, in Chicago, in New York, in Portland, in Los Angeles, in British Columbia, on the way to South America now, on the golf courses along the Metro tracks near Soldier Field and on Northerly Island in Chicago. So let's talk just a little bit about uh, relationship. Between uh, what we usually think of when we think of a city or what we're taught to think of, what's conventional to think about between the artificial and the natural and, um, and about what a city uh, might actually be. Because when you think of a city, where does a city actually end? It certainly doesn't end at the city limit signs in terms of the transfer of energy, food and waste products, transportation, and other animals for that matter. Um, the city is embedded in the country. The country is embedded, embedded in the city. Rural Illinois, uh, I mean, rural China for that matter, is embedded in Chicago. Chicago reaches into those places as well. And I think there's a trickster element in that disruption of duality and the coyote sort of pointing out that the city doesn't end at the city limit signs. So the questions then I think become in terms of physical infrastructure, how might we rewild the landscape and unearth the will of the land? And in terms of our ethical infrastructure, how might we learn to rewild our minds and dance with wildness again? Another way of saying this might be, how do we go between the lines and under the pavement? For me, I think one way to do that is to look to the lead of our non-human neighbors. We've been interacting with and telling stories about other animals for a very long time. And while we might have traded the flicker and warmth of the fire for the soft glow of the reading lamp, if we care about this collective journey that we're on, we still look to the lives of other animals for cues, symbols, and practical guidance in the world. As the great contemporary mythological bard Martin Shaw observes, it's a form of hypnosis to create a story where the only face looking back at you is a human face. There are many stories around us, many non-human stories around us. Story isn't exclusive to human beings. So what you're seeing on your screen right now is a photograph I took uh, a while back. And it's sometimes referred to as the mutual gaze, this eye to eye exchange uh, between viewer and viewed. When another animal seems to regard us, they seem to be taking our measure, staring straight at us. And we're pierced with that recognition or can be in this moment of mutual gaze, we're pierced with that recognition that this other animal is not an underling, it's not a lesser form of life. This is a creature with her own agency, interest, cognition, languages, and story of becoming. One of the main points that I'd like you to take away from this talk this morning is that our stories are entwined and being attentive to this can bring about mutual flourishing. So how do we bring the world of other animals into our consciousness, into our practice, into our everyday world and landscape? This is a story shift that I'd like to encourage. And uh, if, you, if you don't happen to be there, if you do think of cities as somehow less than or, or unwild or unnatural, I remember when this clicked for me, um, all the non-pavement around me started looking, uh, stopped, uh, excuse me, stopped looking like weedy, quote unquote, undeveloped vacant land and became exciting potential, life-giving habitat. It was on a walk with um, a friend of mine named Lisa Hish and seeing the work that she and her neighbors done on what they call the pollinator pathway. So Lisa lives um, on the north side of Chicago, just a couple of miles north of, of the loop. And 
she is an amateur apiarist. Uh, she takes care of, she took care of beehives with her partner. So that um, act of t having backyard beehives began to lead her to think about where did the bees get their food? Where did they get the, the, their nectar? And what were their sources of sustenance in her immediate neighborhood? So she began to map those um, flowers and the vegetation of the neighborhood. And by that simple step, her neighbors became interested in what she was doing. And then she noticed um, that a lot of the street corners in her neighborhood were simply kind of invasive, made up of invasive plants or pavement. Um, they were just, you know, sort of biologically depauperate. And so they started an initiative in their neighborhood to have families adopt a street corner. So three or four families would adopt a street corner. And then the only real rules were to plant native species that would be useful or beneficial to uh, other animals and, um, and then decorate it or add their artistic touches um, as they saw fit. So they, uh, I sometimes call this uh, thinking like a bee. Lisa and her neighbor, neighbors bound together in solidarity and began thinking like a bee. And from that, they started noticing a whole wealth of other wildlife in their very urban neighborhood and talking about it and talking about how they could um, make it even um, more welcoming to other uh, species other than human species. And so they devised this idea called the uh, pollinator. So from the Parkway Corner Initiative, which you see here on your screen, I was just talking about the adopting these corners um, came the pollinator pathway, which was taking those corners and linking them in a linear corridor from the Chicago River to Lake Michigan. Uh, so um, their ambitions grew as their interest in the non-human world grew. And when I asked Lisa about the way that these patches influenced her view of the city, she said that I used to think of cities and urban areas as granting us proximity to live and work with easy access to each other and access to the commons. But I was defining commons as public services, libraries, public transport, parks, blocks of businesses. So as Lisa and I walked together, I started to see um, things very differently in her neighborhood. It was like seeing a book's white space instead of the ink that forms the words. The scrawl of the cars and the roads faded and every lawn, every road median and shoulder, every balcony and flower bed and roof and forgotten patch of grass between buildings emerged from the background as an opportunity for life. Lisa went on to say, now I see cities as habitat. That's the commons for her now. A place to keep us living efficiently as a species, but also places where we still need to be in relationship with other species for our health, our understanding of our place in the world. So that's the aha moment I had with Lisa. I looked around at these nondescript medians and street corners and suddenly saw them as a wild background that with a little human care would make all sorts of lives and livelihoods possible. With all the overwhelming problems facing us in the 21st century, this is where I find hope and meaning. Trying to take on complicated global problems is daunting and it can be psychologically paralyzing. But what about your ba backyard? What about your balcony? What about your neighborhood's street corners? Think small and you end up thinking big Care for the small wonders and you'll end up caring for what a city looks like and how it fits in within its bioregion. Think about milkweed, for example, and you'll end up thinking about perhaps the 2000 mile migration of monarch butterflies who will be arriving very soon in the Chicagoland area. So I've called this micro re rewilding, you know, small scale rewilding in the neighborhood, on the balcony, in the backyard. But another word for it is just neighborliness. 
The city is habitat and it's worth exploring. If you follow your sense of wonder, I think it will lead you to see the city with new eyes. There's a wild world that's waiting. Uh, Sharon Blackie in her book, The Enchanted Life reminds us that human mythologies and cosmologies have always emerged from the landscape. They don't just come out of our heads. They're a product of our immersion in the world, of our interaction with our places. In a sense, they're acts of co-creation between humans and the land. Something I realized only after the fact was that a strand of my book, The Way of Coyote, one might say its underlying root system, is digging for the mythology of place, those older, more enduring narratives that are a part of this landscape. So searching underneath the concrete for a pulse that still beats, for a song that still quavers in the air. And when you look to the cracks, the hinges, the joints, the spaces in between, you're bound to find a coyote. Other animals can, re, uh, can help us rethink and restory our urban areas. As we engage our landscapes, we weave our own stories into the tracks, trails, flyways, traces, underground burrows of others. Our stories become entwined. Fresh stories are created. So uh, I'd like to offer this thought, coming back to that idea that we live with stories whether we know it or not, that we carry these around in our heads and they interact with the stories all around us, non-human stories. The world is made of stories. Each burr oak, each patch of prairie, each layer of asphalt, each city dump, there are stories there. Stories of human forbearance, stories of human integration, stories of human abuse, stories with values embedded. There's one story that tells a tale of the land as a commodity, and it usually reduces the land and its denizens to numbers, quantifiable things, dollars, acres, lots, parcels, taxable property. But there's another story alongside that one, and it's one with yips and quarks and caws and snuffles and burbles and chirps, and that tells a tale of the land as a community to which we belong, a commons, co-inhabited matrix of life. What I'm suggesting is that there are many other stories worth hearing, stories to which we must listen deeply, non-human stories of struggle, survival, and flourishing. These stories are not on the pages of any book not even the one I wrote, because they're entangled, living, breathing, as Sharon Blackie said, co-creations. These life stories intersect with our own and they lure us onward into wonder and from wonder into care and from care into entangled relationship. We begin where we are, which means that for those of us in Chicago, we cease treating cities as throwaway landscapes. That requires something of us, but it also benefits us because what greater task is there than to move toward opening up possibilities for life, for large scale healing. Cities can be life giving, life holding, life generating, life encouraging. And if we get our cities right, then I'm confident that we could turn the Anthropocene into what philosopher Glenn Albrecht calls the symbiocene. Here, here's another coyote lesson. In his trickster guise, coyote is often depicted as having no way of his own. He's sometimes called the great imitator. Um, and I used to feel a bit sorry for coyote because he bungles into so many um, situations where he puts himself in danger out of his own um, you know, uh, rashness or stupidity or um, thinking he's got the right thing uh, in his hip pocket. But uh, Lewis Hyde, going back to Hyde here on Tricksters, 
gives us another perspective. He, said, he says, perhaps having no way also means that a creature can adapt itself to a changing world. Species well situated in a natural habitat are always at risk if that habitat changes. So with all the habitat change that we've seen in our short lifetimes, there's an advantage to being a very adaptive animal, which coyote uh, certainly is. Um, this sometimes goes, goes by the name behavioral plasticity. Coyote has many strategies for surviving. And I think that there's a lesson there um, for us as well, that coyote in some way is here in Chicago and in cities around the United States um, telling us, if you will, to adapt, adapt, give up your will to master, to impose your will upon the landscape and learn how to adapt and align yourself with the landscape. Community, not commodity. So um, that's long-term work, of course. Fixes aren't easy and I don't mean to imply that they are. Our ears need to be attuned to the larger music of the land and that takes time. But I'd suggest that the uh, best way to open our ears to that music is through the work of our hands, like the pollinator pathway, you know, that we find ways to reweave our relationship, our stories with the stories of other animals from the balcony to the backyard to the bioregion. So I opened with a story and I would like to close with a story. It's a story of what will outlive us, a story about what is there even when we may think it has vanished. It's a story about the music that slips between the buildings and the L train, a trickster come to remind us of things that we might have ignored or forgotten. This is called coyotism. Black nose glistening an inch off the pavement. The snows have pulled back, a warmer earth on the way. Rain drizzles down my golden snout, opens up ripe aromas. Fresh baked pastries, blossoms in the median diesel exhaust. A slickened rainbow promises unkept of puddled motor oil. You tried your best. Money, bureaucracy, and chemistry form the sticky clay around a geode of bloodlust. New nation hard at work to cleanse the howling wilderness. First traps and rifles, then bounties. Strychnine lace based, mass produced government poisons, thallium sulfate, sodium fluoroacetate, M44 cyanide tubes, so called humane coyote getter. You hung our bodies from fences and cars, tossed our skins and rigid limbs out with the garbage. A lot of people don't know it's still happening. Yet, I'm a born dancer. I jigged into your cities, even when you sleep, especially when you sleep. I know traffic patterns, how to disappear, how to dine at cemeteries. What made me despisable, so disposable? What made you call out varmint with spittle on your lips, made me unworthy of anything but a bullet or poison? It wasn't always this way with two-leggeds, you know? People liked me, really liked me. I mean, sure, I screwed up the way the stars got hung in the sky, but I had, a, I had a hand in creating this land too. Plus, I'm a born comedian. I got my head stuck in a buffalo skull and couldn't find my own asshole once. What I'm really good at is thinking outside the box. You might wanna pay attention. U.S. Department of Agriculture, Wildlife Services, annual statistics, 2018, likely underrepresented and underreported, killed, no, murdered, 3,700, excuse me, 375 cougars, 357 wolves, 361 black bears, 1,014 bobcats, 1,948 gray foxes, 1,705 red foxes, 22,656 beavers, and 
68,292 coyotes. I win again, all paid for by your taxes. In your mind, I've always carried more fur than or fang, more than merely a threat to sheep and peaceable kingdoms. You militarize biocide because you knew deep in your bones, I carry a cosmology, one that keeps you up at night. I am trickster, transformation, change, adaptation. I'll circle behind you, my lip curled in what passes for a smile. Border walls, glass ceilings, red lines, either or, white and. The world becomes hypoxic without circulation. Control, a product of fear, opposes trickster play. Control, keeping people in their place, industrializing agriculture, hoarding fossil fuels, clinging to private pro property, lusting for political power to become better hoarders leads to cataclysm. This is not my way. Why succumb to failure of imagination? You hear me chorusing, yips atop discarded, junked out cars, your wildly thumping hearts know how to answer. I require only this, give up the pretense that this land is yours. Oh, and a little bit of parting advice. Learn the old ways. Move with your nose close to the land, dig beneath the pavement, keep faith with life. Arch that spine of yours every once in a while and call to the moon. I'll be nearby, always. The way of coyote is a shared journey that includes all of us. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks so much, Gavin. I think that all of us would agree that we would love to, to live in that world that you imagined where we're embedded in symbiosis with, uh, with nature. Yes, well, we have to keep working. <laughs> okay, so um, we will share a link to Gavin's book, The Way of, uh, Way of Coyote in the chat. Uh, Gavin will be answering questions in a, in a few moments. Uh, the Q&A period will follow and the viewers should be thinking about their questions and entering them in the chat box. Uh, right now we'll have a musical interlude uh, where we'll, we will be collecting contributions. Contributions will be collected virtually at the following website address, ethicalhumanistsociety.org slash donate. You can use a credit card or PayPal there, or you can use the Zelle app at donate at ethicalhuman.org. It is through our generosity that we show how meaningful the Sunday morning programs are. The suggested donation is $5. However, any amount that one is comfortable with is greatly appreciated. We appreciate all of those who help sustain the society with their donations of time and money.
All right. Uh, the chat box is now open for questions. I'll, I'll try to get to as many questions as possible. Uh, but Gavin has agreed to stay for a few moment, moments at the coffee hour at the end of this uh, at the end of this talk, and yeah, he can uh, answer a few more. Uh, first question. Uh, let's see. Can you tell us about the Center for Humans and Nature? Oh, sure. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, so the Center for Humans and Nature, um, we are, our offices are in Libertyville, um, but we have um, largely our presence is through uh, our website and our online journal, Mining Nature. Um, and we are a group that looks at the ethics of uh, and values uh, and the environmental philosophy um, of uh, taking care of and being responsible for uh, the natural world uh, wherever we are. So we have people from all different disciplines and fields that uh, write for us, um, usually revolving around a big, you know, um, juicy thematic question. Um, the latest uh, publication that we have coming out uh, this spring will be What Kind of Ancestor Do You Want to Be? An edited volume that uh, uh, poses that big question and, and has the contributors uh, respond to it. I'm currently working on a, a multi-volume series on the theme of kinship, that is the relationships that we share on biological levels, cultural levels, um, uh, all different scales from the planet to our everyday uh, practice, uh, the ways that we become kin uh, with other uh, species. So um, it's a it's really a forum for discussion. I, I would imagine that a lot of the people here at the Ethical Humanist Society would appreciate um, the various perspectives that um, are represented from all different cultures, all different parts of the world, um, and really talking about that relationship that human beings have with uh, the natural world and how to um, make it one uh, to the degree that we can of, of mutual flourishing. Awesome. Okay, next question. Uh, COVID-19 jumped from non-human animals to animals. Uh, sorry, my screen jumped. Um, is there a lesson there for high density urban environments having interactions with non-human animals? Um, well, you know, I mean, so there are, you know, without being an expert, you know, um, an epidemiologist, uh, you know, my understanding is that there are various factors involved with, the, you know, COVID, including the, the bush trade and, and wildlife um, uh, deforestation, you know, and one of the factors, you know, is, is sort of human proximity and density in a way that, you know, maybe wouldn't have been there, um, say, three centuries ago or two centuries ago. But that said, I mean, um, I think it would be unfair to uh, limit, you know, or to sort of place blame on uh, cities or urban environments as, as um, you know, to look to that as, as a factor that is um, definitive, um, you know, people do have and do argue quite a bit um, for the viability of cities in a in a you know in a in a populated heavily populated world in terms of sustainability you know um, shared resources shared walls shared um, you know all the things that the city provides and offers you know some would say that cities are actually critical to any kind of, you know, uh, sustainability going forward. Um, so, I mean, I would hesitate to, uh, you know, although we won't, we, you know, we don't want to, we want people to, you know, to have the ability to, to not, uh, you know, to live in, to have choice in the way that they, they live and the, and the density that they, you know, desire, but, um, uh, so I'll just say that, you know, sure, you know, like, like any species, you know, the, the our numbers and our, our lives and the ways that they intersect with, with non-human animals, you know, um, could, we need to be aware of and 
and create the could create the conditions for um, a, you know viral spread. Um, so that's one of the things that folks at the um, for instance the Lincoln Park Zoo, the Urban Wildlife Institute there, right here in Chicago. Um, you know, one of the things they look at is zoonotic diseases among uh, you know, and what the vectors are uh, in in a habitat like Chicago. So that's that's something to think about um, for sure. But I wouldn't um, simply say because of the density of human population. I think oftentimes it has much more to do than just that quantity. You know, with the quality of our lives and the quality of relationships. And obviously, there's a rupture there with the way that other animals are being. Um, treated and moved around, you know, globally that needs to be attended to. I think the next question is, is related. Uh, the question is, do coyotes hunt small dogs and cats? And, and maybe the broader question is, you know, how do you deal with coyotes inherent wildness or animals inherent wildness? Yeah. Oh, they certainly do. Um, yeah, they, uh, uh, so this is a situation where being aware of the many species around you in an urban environment can help a great deal and 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 lead to behavioral changes that that we need to take on for instance if we're cat owners you know um uh then then keeping them inside um i mean they're you know and if they're outside, you know, making sure they're supervised. Same thing with small dogs in particular. I mean, I have a, I have a pug, you know, little, you know, <laughs> cute little uh, lovable, uh, you know, uh, stuffed animal. Um, you know, she's, uh, she's awesome. But, you know, I would, I would ne never leave her unattended in my neighborhood because um, there are also coyotes all over the place. So just not to take the, that chance and that that risk, I think, is a part of adjusting our behavior so that other species um, can live and and uh, and thrive. Because, of course, if those food sources aren't there, which that's what it is to a coyote, a food source, um, then they they'll turn to other things. They have an extremely extremely varied diet, you know, from seeds uh, to berries to goose eggs, uh, you know, Canada goose eggs to um, you know, uh, just about any, they're opportunistic, you know, feeders in that sense. So it's something to bear in mind. And, and, and frankly, you know, getting to know about the lives and behaviors of other species, I think can open up, you know, new worlds of our own thinking about the ways that we're interconnected and interrelated. So. Next question is where did the journey start to write this book? Um, so the journey started, uh, literally because I moved to Chicago. Um, I didn't expect to end up in an urban area, much less the third largest city in the United States. You know, I kind of had romantic Thoreauvian ideals of having a cabin, you know, near a pond, <laughs> you know, somewhere um, miles from, uh, you know, the nearest uh, human neighbor. Um, that's not the way it worked out. So I had to adapt. I had to follow Coyote's lead in that sense. Um, so now I found myself in an urban environment. Well, who are my neighbors? Not just my human neighbors, but my non-human neighbors. So that began, um, I do a lot of walking. Um, some of you probably do as well, um, especially during this last year or so. Um, and, um, and so I explore the city on foot and by kayak uh, on the Chicago River and, um, and just, just was discovering the city as a newcomer to Chicago what are the forest preserves like? What are the, what's the lakeshore like? What are these forgotten patches and trails and, and the, the green ways and the blue ways that, that crisscross uh, through, throughout the city? So I just, it was exploration um, on a very physical level, but it was also exploration of uh, who those non-human neighbors were as permanent residents who migrated through who were recent, you know, immigrants, um, who were more long-term, who had been displaced, you know, all those questions was a way for me to find orientation in the city. And that was really where the book started, was just orienting myself to the many forms of life that exist here in Chicago. 
Okay. What do you think of the loss of endangered species designation for wolves recently? Is this a trend for other species too? Um, okay. Well, that's a big, you know, it's a big complicated question because uh, wolves have, they're particularly sort of a lightning rod or poster animal uh, on both sides, a sort of wilderness icon or wilderness, you know, villain, you know, they, they've had all sorts of associations um, poured upon them uh, over the, the centuries uh, after, you know, European American colonization of the Americas. Um, so their species designation has gone back and forth. Um, it's some, it's kind of an on again, off again thing as political went sometimes due to political winds shifting this way or that, but also the positive thing to say is that about that when an, a species is delisted as an endangered species, it's not always because that's it, like, it was a political, there are political machinations involved and that was a move to, you know, that they lost protection is not always a bad thing. Sometimes it means their numbers are recovering. If a species is delisted, that can be a positive sign. Um, uh, now, with wolves in, in particular, though, it is a difficult thing because oftentimes those, when those protections are taken away, um, there's enough people in some of the Western states, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, for instance, who, if those protections aren't in place on a state level, um, there are those all too willing to sort of declare open season on, on wolves. And so then those recovery efforts that have been made in the last, say, two to three decades um, feel uh, fruitless um, or, you know, and it can be ex extremely frustrating. But what you're seeing there really is a conflict of worldviews. You know, those who look at wolves as a fellow, you know, ecological citizen and, and not, you know, to oversimplify a little bit, those who look at wolves as a, as something that is a, an enemy or, or uh, you know, a, a threat to civilization, if you will. So um, that's a long and sort of rambly answer. I'm sure there's a, there's a lot there that, um, that is contained in that question. But the short answer is to say, just um, dig a little deeper. It's not always um, a bad thing when a, a species is delisted, um, it can be a very good thing, in fact. But sometimes it is cause for, for alarm um, because uh, particularly with a, a charismatic species like wolf, wolves, they can become a proxy uh, animal for, for battles over who controls the landscape. Next question is, uh, my favorite trickster is the raccoon. I particularly love the failed attempts about keeping raccoons out of trash bins. Do you have any favorite stories of animals confounding our best urban plans? <laughs> raccoons, I, man, I, I, that's a good one. They are, they're great. Um, the, the deafness and the agility with which they can uh, get into things, get into trouble. Um, I think they made headlines just a couple of years ago. One climbed up the side of a building in Canada. That was it was unbelievable the things that they can they can pull off. Um, let's see any con confounding. That's a hard one. I have to I'd have to think about yeah. that. Like in we terms can come of, back to it if you, if something pops up in your head. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, encounters of all types and combinations are inevitable, inevitable, coyote and others with humans, children, companion animals are, sorry, are, are inevitable. How do we react to or minimize, avoid mutual harms? So you might've talked about this when we talked about the, uh, uh coyotes eating dogs, uh, yeah. but feel, feel to elaborate. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah I, I would just add to that. Um, so the official proclamations from say, you know, the, um, city animal controls and, and they're going to tell you to do things like if you see a coyote uh yell you know wave your arms throw sticks i've seen some that even say you know throw bottles throw it's and the idea behind that is to create 
an aversion among coyotes so that they don't become what is called habituated to human presence. And because if they do, if for instance, people leave dog food out on their back porch and coyotes come to identify that as a, as a food source uh, and will take advantage of that, but then they become habituated to human presence, it does have the potential for creating more conflicts, right? But I always, I will speak very honestly and say that I always have a great deal of difficulty with that kind of um, blanket advice for how to interact or in, with a coyote if you see a coyote or any animal for that matter. And, and so I would just say, rule of thumb, behave respectfully. That's another creature with its own set of intentions. And, um, and so as a last resort, you know, you could do the, the sort of get big, wave your hands, yell, scream, all that. But otherwise, be quiet. <laughs> Just be quiet and, and respectful. And, and more than likely, uh, you know, nine times out of 10, that coyote is going to go his way and you're going to go yours. Okay. Um, next question is more of a comment. Um, Manual Cinema's video Chicagoland features the life of coyotes in the city. It's haunting and beautiful and can be accessed in the work section of their website. Uh, do you want to comment on the, on the film? If at all? Yeah. Yeah. A couple of the screenshots I used were from that very uh, video uh, Chicagoland and, um, Manual Cinema. They interviewed me, and they interviewed uh, uh, the wildlife biologist at the Urban Wildlife Institute, which I mentioned earlier. His name is Seth Magley. Um, and uh, in, in order to sort of shape the theme and content of their film, they they interviewed me. So yeah, it's a it's a really beautiful film for those who it's short. Um, I think maybe only eight minutes, or maybe even less. And um, and uh, the cool thing about manual cinema is they do shadow puppets. So their work is done in a very interesting way, the way that they animate. Um, so yeah, I'd recommend uh, just checking that out. I'm sure you can find it with a simple web search. Okay. How would you describe the public or private fund landscape for projects trying to improve the urban wild relationship? Can you repeat that? Yeah, how would you, how would you describe the current landscape of public and private funds for projects, uh, you know, aligned with, with what you're talking about, the, the urban wild relationship? Hmm. Well, it's hard to know exactly what the, the question, uh, the person had in mind who asked that question, because there's a lot of different ways and sort of a lot of directions that my mind go. But if it's a general comment on just, you know, the way that we um, create spaces that are, that are uh, habitat among the places that we otherwise live, work, and play. I mean, you know, public-private, you know, partnerships are part of that uh, process. But I would just say as a general comment, like, you know, in, in the talk that I just gave, I mentioned the work on the neighborhood level. And I think having that energy, that grassroots energy is kind of critical to any sort of sustained um, effort to create more wild and diverse, you know, uh, green spaces within our cities, because um, although a lot of people, uh, you know, as far as, you know, in, just in terms of buy-in and accountability and, and it, having a sense of coming from within the neighborhood or the community, um, that that's uh, really important. I mean, and that's just kind of a, a general comment, because as I'm sure a lot of the people on here know, if they don't know firsthand or might expect, like, you know, if you have somebody coming in and saying, hey, we're going to build X, Y, or Z here through your neighborhood or over your, <laughs> you know, or we, we have these great plans and these beautiful visions, but, you know, the, the community doesn't have a strong sense of having some um, agency in that, then it's going to be a problem. So cities are great because you have a diversity of of viewpoints and perspectives but the, it can also be really tricky to navigate you know all those th that diversity and that perspective of uh and so um you know having people that are are, are skilled in, in bringing people together and, and in creating consensus i think is is really important for any urban project 
Um, how does the, the $100 billion plus market for farmed animals fit into our relationship with nature? Well, I mean, it's, uh, so without, again, without knowing exactly, you know, what the, the, the questioner is, at, is after there, I'll just say that what that, you know, brings to mind for me is in terms of, of, I mean, it's, it's a tragedy. It's an ecological and ethical tragedy, right? Industrial farming, confined animal feeding operations. I mean, it creates more problems than it solves, not to mention treating um, other animals as machines, as um, unfeeling, unthinking, unstoried, if we want to go back to my talk, um, you know, objects, not subjects or agents with their own um, their own ways of being. So it's a reductive, incredibly reductive. Um, and I guess to pull back from the talk, you know, it's the difference between land as commodity and land as community. So um, animals, um, whether wild or domestic, um, it's important to honor their lives. And, um, and if that means, it doesn't always mean not not eating other animals, obviously, as human beings, we've eaten animals for, you know, for millennia. Um, but it means, can you do that with honor and respect and with mindfulness? Okay. Uh, do you have any ideas of what you think the Chicago Park District could do to help people in the city become more symbiotic with wildlife? Well, that's a, that's a good question. It's a question really for the Chicago Park District folks. I've worked with a, or, or had, you know, engaged with a, a few people on, in Chicago Park District, but it's been a little while now. Um, and, you know, I know that they, they, um, I, I guess I would advise folks that are interested in that to also look to the, the coalition of government and non-governmental organizations that go under the banner of Chicago Wilderness. Um, there's a lot of uh, amazing initiatives and collaborations going on there. And I believe Chicago Park District is part of that larger coalition. Um, but as far as what they can do to help people become more symbiotic with wildlife, I mean, I think it's providing, um, encouraging that sense of wonder, that sense of, wow, curiosity uh, about the other animals that live in the city with us, that pass through the city with us. So anything that that furthers that, whether it's it could be educational programs, it could be signage in parks, it could be small groups, uh, trail led, you know, guided, you know, um, uh, guided walks, you know, all those things. Anything that contributes to opening the door for somebody to uh, the 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 knowledge that this is a more than human world that we live in. Okay, uh, that is all the questions that I've seen on my screen. I, I, I think we have time for one more, so I'll ask the audience if they have any other questions. Uh, while we wait, I, I, I have a question of my own. So I've actually seen coyotes, and I think the only way that I've seen them is, and this is pre-COVID, is riding the Metra, and I've seen coyotes very rarely, but I have seen you them. You saw a coyote riding the Metra? <laughs> <laughs> that's the that would oh, okay. be a sight. That'd be, I, I told you, I saw a coyote looking out the window. Okay, the same color as the grass. I would never have seen it had it not moved slightly. Mm -hmm. But I've heard, uh, I've read up after that, that those, those are actually managed by the city. I, I believe, and, and correct me if I'm wrong. And I just want to know if you had any thoughts on on have you talked to that group that actually works with those coyotes and uh, you know maybe what's their goal and, and, and any thoughts on that? Sure. So uh, another good resource for folks who are interested in follow up here is. Um, uh, a fellow named Stan Gert, G-E-H-R-T, and he works at Ohio State University. And they have a, it's three decades old now, I think, studying and researching coyotes in the Chicago area, among other cities, but, you know. Um, and Stan will, he and his team will radio collar coyotes, you know, put a, a tracking collar on them to see where they're moving and where they're denning and um, the territories that they establish um, in, in Chicago and the suburbs. 
So um, they don't have every coyote radio collared, um, obviously, but um, it does give them a sense of the patterns and the uses of certain landscapes. And, you know, essentially, so they don't uh, manage them. You know, coyotes are, are not to be managed other than, you know, if there's a coyote that becomes a quote unquote problem coyote, that is, becomes too habituated to other human beings or, you know, um, seems like it would be a threat, then that coyote would be removed, but that would not be by Stan and his team. That would be by animal uh, control, I think. But anyway, my point here is that um, coyotes are everywhere. And so that coyote, Bobby, that you saw looking out the window uh, of the Metro train is not unusual. And once you start to open your eyes to that, um, you might be surprised at how many places they're really good at, at staying out of sight Stan, in fact, calls them the ghosts of Chicago because they're so good at, you know, sort of uh, moving around at night and hunting at night and then kind of staying largely uh, out of sight during the daytime. But there, that's not um, that's not always true. I mean, I've seen plenty of coyotes in the daytime and Graceland Cemetery, um, you know, on the uh, golf court, public golf courses, you know, Metra embankments, they use the Metra as a corridor, you know, oftentimes to get between places. So, so they're everywhere and, uh, and they can live in the darndest places and raise families in the, some places that you would think would be impossible to do so. That's awesome. So, so there were no other questions, but I know that Gavin has uh, said that he'd be willing to spend a few minutes uh, at the coffee hour to ask any other questions that do come up. Oh, the, the, oh there actually was one more question. Um, let, let, let's uh, let's do it real quickly then. Uh, do you know anything about the condition of the coyote cubs that lived in Roseville Cemetery who had lost so much of their hair before winter that natural resources, I think, took them to a sanctuary to heal in December? I don't know anything about okay. that. So right. yeah, you'd have to follow up with the sanctuary. Okay, that's great, thank you. Um, so um, I will, before closing, uh, read some announcements of upcoming society events. Uh, let's see, maybe if we can put those up. All right, well, let me adjust my screen a little bit. Okay, following the program today, we'll have a virtual coffee hour. Bring your own coffee or snacks and join us for an open Zoom chat. Click on the link in the comment section or go to ethicalhumanistsociety.org slash coffee hour. Our next community chat will be this Wednesday, April 28th at 7 p.m. We'll share friendship, issues of the day, and fun in a caring Zoom chat. Join us to connect and appreciate and enjoy each other's company. Go to ethicalhumanistsociety.org slash community chat to link directly to the Zoom sec session at on the last Wednesday of the month. Next Sunday, May 2nd, uh, David Wessel, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who spent 30 years at the Wall Street Journal and is now at the Brookings Institution and a frequent contributor to NPR's Morning Edition, will present Speaking Truth to Power, Journalism and Social Media. Wessel will discuss how public intellectuals and journalists have had to adapt to the rise of social media and the shouting matches on cable TV. He will explain the challenges this poses to journalists and think tank scholars and the ways in which he has responded to the shortening attention spans of the public and the polarization in society that has eroded common understanding of facts. For more details on these or any of our other activities, see our website at ethicalhumanistsociety.org connect with us on Facebook and Twitter, and subscribe to our YouTube channel for videos of past speakers and future streaming programs. Uh, I will now uh, end today's uh, uh, program with uh, a closing quote. Uh, before I do, uh, I'd like to encourage viewers to join us uh, as, on Zoom um, for our coffee hour. Uh, first quote, the two short ones. He, is, he who is cruel to animals becomes hard also in his dealings with men. We can judge the heart of a man by his treatment of anim animals. And that was Immanuel Kant. And next, until we extend our circle of compassion to all living things, humanity will not find peace. And that's Albert Schweitzer. 
So thanks, thanks everyone for coming and thanks again, Gavin, for a wonderful presentation.